And let me just say that I'm sorry that it took a while for this video to come out. For some reason, Parody Ben really wanted to borrow my webcam. I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law. So help me go- So, it's very clear that I'm not going to be doing all of the Virgin New Adventures and 8th Doctor Adventures, partly because I'm probably not going to be doing this in 11 years time, and also because I'm probably going to skip at least a few of these on either range. However, I wanted to hold off on skipping any immediately, and I really wanted to see what I would make of this one. It's right between Timeworm Exodus, which is a Terence Dix novel, and Timeworm Revelations, which I've heard great things about. So that's uh, an awkward place to be. I wanted to give it a fair shot, and to be fair, I do have things worth talking about here. But I'd be lying if I said I was recommending this. I think it's an unfortunate combination of having a lot of lore and a lot of names it needs to convey and a lot of characters combined with the fact that it's not got the most elegant means of communicating the information it needs to communicate. In brief, the Doctor and Ace go to the future, to the end of the universe, and they land on a planet called Kirith. The indigenous people are highly intelligent supermodels being led and cared for by a race called the Pangistri. The Corinthians are content with their lot, but a lot of them have memories missing, and when their own go to join the Pangistri on their island, Kandasi, they never come back. It turns out the Pangistri have created the Corinthians and their whole society in order to make a perfect race, from which they'll harvest all their minds, so, um they can create God, uh, a creature powerful enough to stop the universe ending. Uh, and while they're at it, they're doing a lot of genetic experiments, uh, creating monsters. Oh, and the Time Worms secretly running the whole thing. See what I mean? It's a very big convoluted plot with so much information, so much lore, that the novel really does buckle under the weight of it. Tell Don't Show is a bit of an overused criticism. It, it does apply, I think, in cases where the prose is literally just describing a character as likable. There's got to be some of the most inelegant prose that I've read in a while, and that's even including Time Worm Genesis. If you're trying to describe a place as ominous, it seems a bit overkill to start name-dropping concentration camps. Like the Nazis! Why Nazis? That was kind of weird. When it saw Ace and Raphael, its eyes fixed them with a baleful stare, and its mouth let out a hideous, blood-curling screech, like the caw of a trapped and tortured bird holding them responsible for its present situation. Like, you see what I mean. Coming after Vampire Science or Time Worm Exodus, the gulf is a bit difficult for me to swallow. I mentioned inexperience as a possible reason for Time Worm Genesis ending up the way it does. This reads like someone's early work. There's a scene where the Doctor reveals to a character that his whole people's history is actually faked. Unfortunately, we only found out about that history literally the page before, so it doesn't really have the effect it should do. I also think fault might be with the editing here. Given these books are being put out month after month, I do wonder how much time they had. As with all of the previous novels, there are quite a few spelling errors. Some very obvious instances in this one where I gets replaced with one. Uh, just made me think there was a bit of a find and replace issue there. Also, there's a character called Miral whose name got changed to Mint a couple of times. But I've heard good things about Nigel Robertson's work in the future, and he's written target novels before this, so I don't want to be mean. Especially considering I think there's actually a fair bit to praise him for here. For one, I think he actually really gets the Seventh Doctor and Ace. He writes Seven as a disruptive influence, which isn't, like, unique for the Doctor, but for anyone who knows the Carmel era and its politics, this is very appropriate for this Doctor. He's also the first writer to, I think, be really interested in Ace. This is a very Ace-focused novel. There's mention of, you know, some of her trauma and her psychology. It does factor into the climax. Also, she's in a love triangle now. Now, I, I know that sounds bad, 
Yes, Ace has a new love interest. His name is Raphael. Having Ace canonically show a sexual attraction to mutated turtles that live in sewers and practice the ninja arts uh, is actually a bold creative decision. And fuck it, at least it's not more incest. Ace handles it, like, pretty maturely. She says to the other girl, I don't care. He's yours, do what you want. Unfortunately, the other girl in the love triangle isn't faring so well. Raphael is the only motivation we're given for her at first. And then she's this opportunistic second-in-command who replaces one of the villains after portraying him. I would say that there are just too many characters, and Robertson's not able to make that many of them compelling. Only really Raphael gets a clear emotional through-line. One of the villains gets an entire backstory summed up over a few paragraphs, and I could barely tell you any of it because it barely played into what he was doing. We've been telling stories about the Doctor inciting rebellions against seemingly idyllic oppressors since the very early days of the show, and it's handled very interestingly here. The rebellion the Ace and the Doctor incite is put down horribly by the pangistry. Genuinely harrowing stuff about people tripping over themselves to get away from the massacre. And once it's all over, a lot of them just forget what the pangistry just tried to put things back to normal and start providing for them again. It's mature because it speaks to the fact that progress is not always on a continual upward trajectory. Real changes can be reset and history can be forgotten. Swear that I will pay true allegiance to... Swear that I will pay true allegiance to... One sec, I'll start again. Patrick Troutson makes an appearance in this novel, and you'd actually think that would make it more of a talking point, but it actually doesn't. This seems like another crack at previous Doctors being involved in the ongoing Time Worm story, like Genesis did with its hologram of the fourth Doctor and the third Doctor taking over for a second. This is a much better execution of that, I've got to say. Here, it turns out that after Time Worm Exodus, the Time Worm got banished back in time, uh, snuck back into the Doctor's past, took over him, right after he regenerated into the second Doctor, until it could possess a little girl that the second Doctor ran into, who would go on to be the Grand Matriarch of the Pangistry. It feels reminiscent of what Remembrance of the Daleks did with the Hand of Omega and the First Doctor and Cole Hill School. I don't think it was done as well as it was in Remembrance of the Daleks, but there's never any shame in not being as good as Remembrance of the Daleks. Even though it's short, it was very hard for me to get through this one, and I did keep putting it off. At the same time, this is probably the first of the Virgin New Adventures that feels like it's really interested in the Seventh Doctor and Ace, and actually wants to engage with the last TV era which is laudable. It doesn't work in my opinion, but that's why it's important to master the basics before we go on to try and do anything experimental. And who knows, maybe they'll figure out how to spell time worm properly. <laughs>